On July 24, 1777, in the midst of the American Revolution, about 100 women gathered outside a large warehouse in Boston, Massachusetts. They believed that the owner, Thomas Boylston, was hoarding food supplies to drive up their prices so he could make a huge profit. When Boylston refused to lower his prices, the women attacked, and they beat him until he surrendered his keys. Then they helped themselves to his stores of food. According to Abigail Adams, a large concourse of men stood by as amazed, silent spectators. What, you didn't read that in your U.S. history textbook? Me neither. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... So huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History is about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, Episode 17. We are coming to you this week from the Minuteman Studios, located somewhere outside of Boston, Massachusetts. As always, I am taking direction from our one-of-a-kind executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Hey, Lulu, you coming out for a few beers with the crew once we finish up with this episode? Not in a million years. Okay. I'll put you down as a maybe. All right, so what's going on at In the Past Lane? Well, as many of you know, my real job is as a college professor at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. So I'm in back-to-school mode. Only this time, it's a little different since I'm coming off a year-long sabbatical. Now let me tell you, a sabbatical is a wonderful thing. You get away from classes and grading papers, and you get away from meetings. And you get time to finish lingering projects and plunge into new ones. In my case, I did a lot of writing. I also researched my next book project. More about that later. And yes, I started this podcast. It has been such a blast, and I am so grateful for all you listeners. So now that I'm back to teaching, my challenge is to keep up within the past lane while carrying out my duties at the college, like teaching, grading papers, holding office hours, and yes, attending all those meetings. Ugh. So what else is going on? Well, a few days ago, I went to New York City to sit for a filmed interview about the Gilded Age, a topic I've written quite a bit about in the last few years. It's for a big documentary that's going to air on PBS's American Experience in about 18 months, and I am really excited about this project. Okay, enough about the exciting life of your historian at large. You can always learn more about me and what I'm up to at inthepastlane.com. You can follow me on Twitter, at inthepastlane and also on Facebook. Let's turn to this episode of In the Past Lane. Our focus this week is the American Revolution. Now, you might think that you have a pretty good grasp of the basic story of the American Revolution, but this episode is going to surprise you. It's going to challenge your understanding of the American Revolution by examining it from different angles, by taking into account the experiences of various groups of people who are usually left out of the story, by thinking of the American Revolution in a much larger time frame, and by bringing into the story aspects of the American Revolution that are messy, unpleasant, and often at odds with our notions of noble patriots fighting a righteous war of liberty against the repressive British. To lead us in this new look at the American Revolution, we will talk with the award-winning historian Alan Taylor about his new book, American Revolutions, A Continental History, 1750 to 1804. His take on the revolution is both fresh and fascinating. Next, we'll explore a little-known event that challenges the familiar story that the American Revolution began at Lexington and Concord, April 1775. Okay, people, quit arguing about who gets to sit shotgun. Your journey in the past lane begins now.
Okay, we're back. Alan Taylor is professor of history at the University of Virginia, two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. He is the author of many books, including The Internal Enemy, Slavery and the War in Virginia, 1722 to 1832, The Civil War of 1812, American Citizens, British Subjects, Irish Rebels and Indian Allies, and Divided Ground, Indians, Settlers, and the Northern Borderland of the American Revolution. His most recent book is American Revolutions, A Continental History, 1750 to 1804. Alan Taylor, welcome to In the Pass Lane. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, I'd like to begin by asking you about the title of your book. Many people who would consider themselves pretty well versed in American history might be surprised by the title. First of all, you have the title as American Revolutions, which is plural. And this hints at the idea that there's at least something notion of revolutions within the revolution. And a second aspect of it is you subtitle it A Continental History, which also suggests kind of a different view on the revolution, a much larger one that goes beyond the 13 colonies hugging the Atlantic coast. And then thirdly, the date frame or the time period that you select, 1750 to 1804, seems much larger than what most people think of when they think of the American Revolution. So how is it that you came to see the revolution in such expansive terms? Well, I did an earlier book called American Colonies, which attempted to look at colonial America as much more than the Atlantic seaboard colonies of the British Empire, but to include the French, the Spanish, and even the Russian colonies elsewhere in the continent. So to think about the North American continent as a whole. And so in writing a sequel to that, I'm trying to consider the American Revolution as something that didn't just happen along the Atlantic seaboard but also involved the interior and the many native peoples there, and also the other empires of North America. Of course, the British had occupied French Canada, but the French are going to be involved in this war, and the Spanish are going to be expanding their own empire in North America during the war. So the title indicates both the large geographic scale and then the many different forms that the revolution took in the different parts of the continent. And then also that the revolution meant different things to people within the Patriot Coalition. And they would continue to argue about the implications of the revolution in the next political generation. And indeed, we've been arguing about it ever since. So the revolution strikes me as something that's plural in that it's had many dimensions in different parts of the continent. And it had many different legacies for different Americans ever since. One of the things that strikes me is you really beginning it so much earlier than one normally would would think. And that does put it into that larger, almost global context with these contesting empires in North America. And the, the key event there is obviously the Seven Years' War, or the French and Indian War, which the colonists and the British are victorious in in 1763. And at that moment, it looks like a rosy chapter is about to open for British North America, but it's not quite the story. Perhaps you could tell us about what now appears in the way you tell it, the first real stirrings of resistance to British authority or not in Boston or in Philadelphia, but actually out there in Western Pennsylvania and other areas on the frontier? Well, I think you can't really understand the coming of the revolution without paying some attention to the Seven Years' War in North America, which transforms the situation and greatly expands the British national debt. And so Britain, in the wake of this triumphant war, is feeling quite proud of itself and wants to rearrange the empire and make it more rational, and get it to generate new revenues, at the same time that the empire has additional administrative costs, particularly to garrison Canada and then the interior of the continent as far as the Mississippi River. And the colonists, in the wake of this, are are thinking they've got a green light to expand westward into Indian country, and they don't like that these British garrisons in the west are in some ways inhibiting their expansion west, and trying to maintain peace with Native peoples on terms that enable the Native peoples to persist in that region. So I think that the American Revolution is generated not simply by the new taxes that Parliament levies, but by a general pattern of British behavior to try to restrict colonial behavior and to rationalize the empire And both of these impulses are coming out of the British success in conquering Canada and the Ohio Valley in the Seven Years' War. Yeah, it seems that for the British, for the British authorities, their prize, their their primary goal is order. And for the colonists, their primary goal, as they see it after the war, which they believe they've helped win at a high cost, they don't care so much about order as they do about opportunity. And that's really where the, the two visions clash. Yeah, and there's, there's also different notions of what is the 
place of these colonists in the empire. And the colonists can imagine themselves as partners in the empire, as having pulled their weight in this war. And as partners in the empire, they want to have a fairly free hand to expand westward. The British have the notion that the colonists didn't do as much as they should have done in the war, that they had smuggled with the enemy, that their troops had not performed well, and that the colonists had been quite reluctant to advance the finances necessary for the war until Britain started partially compensating them. So the British come out of the war with a notion that the colonists really need to be subordinated in new ways. And so the inflated expectations of the colonists and the efforts by the British imperialists to restrain them are on a collision course. Yes. And then from there, it also does eventually become an issue of, about taxation. And some of the action begins to shift towards the more familiar terrain, and to the way that people understand the revolution, places like Boston and Philadelphia and New York, with resistance to colonial taxation. And one of the things you point out is that uh, although the, these taxes are new, they still put Americans, American colonists, far down on the scale of taxed people within the British realm, that they are taxed at a much lower rate than people living in England, for example. But they're still fired up about this. And to some degree, this is, a, I guess, a product of elites in eastern cities who see some benefit in stirring up popular unrest. Yes, the taxes are low, but it is the precedent of the thing which is getting the colonists quite agitated. Because their fear is that if they accept the precedent that Parliament can levy these relatively small taxes, that Parliament will be back asking more in the future. And then the colonists won't have a very good argument. They're making a constitutional argument, which is that Parliament has the power to levy no taxes on them, that only their own colonial legislature in each individual colony has that power. Now, when these taxes are first proposed, there are economic problems in the seaport cities in particular. There are high rates of unemployment. Uh, there are a lot of poor people that are in the poor house. And there are a lot of nervous elites in these seaports that, uh, that things are going to get out of control, that there will be rioting. And so the savvier elements among the elites see an opportunity in the British taxes to rally protests, to focus on Britain's parliament as really the primary source of economic problems in the colonies. And there's some plausibility to that because the British are also enforcing their customs regulations uh, to a greater degree than ever before. And they are seizing a larger number of ships and they are enforcing restrictions on colonial currency. And they have also, in subtle ways, increased taxes on uh, imported molasses and sugar. Uh, not increase the overall taxes, but tighten the enforcement of them so that the revenue actually goes up. And all of these things then make it plausible for uh, am ambitious politicians like Samuel Adams to say, the real culprit here is Parliament and then the British officers who are enforcing the laws of Parliament. Right. They become the focus of popular energy and anger. And ultimately, this is in the familiar telling, uh, this does lead to the American Revolution, uh, which begins in 1775 and runs on for another, depending on how you figure it, seven or eight years. And in the course of your description of the war, which is a great detailed account of both the battlefields, but also the political machinations behind the scenes, but also the really the, the stuff that really stands out is, and this I think gets towards your, your notion of revolutions and also the claim that you make that this really is America's first civil war the internal divisions that really are exemplified in the war, that not everybody is interpreting the war in the same way and fighting for the same the same cause. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that, starting with the most basic division, which is loyalist versus patriot versus, I guess what we call them, neutrals or fence-sitters. Well, uh, often they're called the disaffected. Uh, they're disaffected from both sides. As I looked at the revolution closely and as I look at the most recent scholarship, there's growing attention to the disaffected and to popular loyalism, so that I think we have a clearer picture that the revolution did not unite Americans against the British, which is the classic way in which we narrate the revolution, that loyalists were quite significant and even more significant, larger in number, were the disaffected. And these were people who just wanted to stay on their farms and be left alone. They didn't want to get drafted by either side. They didn't want to take oaths of allegiance to either side. And they didn't like the higher taxes that they were paying to their patriot state after independence. 
And so um, a major challenge facing the Patriot leadership is how to cope with the disaffected. And they chiefly try to do this by intimidating the loyalists and those disaffected whose behavior seem to be verging on uh, loyalist resistance to the Patriot leadership. And they did so through the committees of safety and other sort of unofficial organizations. And your account really does bring out the fact that this was not just a lot of you know, rhetorical urging and, and cheerleading. There was violence, there was coercion that took place to really force people to choose sides and ideally, from the Patriots' perspective, to choose their side. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we, we tend to focus on the major battles and on the conventional armies when we narrate the revolution. And I certainly pay attention to those things, but the dimension that I think gets relatively short shrift are behind the major theaters of combat contests between patriot and loyalist militias and particularly in the in these war zones around where the british occupy major seaports so during the war the british will occupy all the major seaports and with the exception of around boston where the siege is quite tight there are these broad zones such as westchester county new york or around philadelphia which invite bandit gangs and partisans for both the loyalists and the patriots to plunder the local people in the name of putting pressure on them to support one side or the other. And so the areas that are relatively immune from this sort of irregular warfare are pretty few and far between when we look at the big picture of the revolution. And I think it is those zones that in many ways define the experience of the largest number of Americans during the era of the violence of the American Revolution. Right. So it's a picture of a very divided populace and one that is very hard pressed in terms of choosing sides. And also, even if you're not coerced by a band of armed patriots, you also just simply face the prospect of one or the other hungry armies coming across your territory and taking everything you have, all your livestock, all your winter stores simply because these armies, particularly the American army, was so often so poorly funded and poorly supplied. Exactly. To have an army in your vicinity of either side, no matter what your allegiance is, to have that army in your vicinity can be bad news because they need firewood, so they're going to help themselves to your fences, and they need food. So soldiers are going to get out of control, and they're going to steal your chickens, uh, and help themselves to the apples in your orchard or the crops growing in your garden. And officers will send around parties of men to seize horses and cattle and blankets, and they will give you IOUs, but often these IOUs are worthless in the long run. Right, and it could also open you up to accusations of aiding the enemy by the other side. They see that the British have taken all your things and left you with an IOU. It, like I said, in some ways opens you up to being accused of being a loyalist, even though it was essentially done at gunpoint. Yeah. Yeah, there are lots of people that are caught in the middle, and there are lots of people who are trying to calculate the basis of the ebb and flow of military success between the two sides as to which side they should support at any given moment. Yeah, it's a very different picture than this idea of a united people giving everything all for the glorious cause. It's a much more real story, and we see these being played out in civil wars and revolutions around the world today where you know, the average person is simply trying to survive and trying to find a way to survive while a small groups of hardcore fighters are, are fighting it out all across their front lawns in, in many ways. Another dimension I want to ask you about, which you give a considerable amount of attention to, is the American Revolution experience for African Americans. They constitute about 20% of the population, which is far higher than most people would, would I think, guess. And they are in a unique position at the very beginning of the war. Perhaps you could tell us more about that. Slavery is legal uh, in every single colony. It's as legal in Massachusetts as in Virginia. But certainly the numbers of enslaved people are skewed toward the South. Virginia has something on the order of half of the enslaved people, but there are also significant numbers in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. And when the revolution comes along, uh, many of the enslaved people, particularly where they're most concentrated in the South, are inclined to have a hopeful belief that the British king has issued an order for their emancipation, but that the patriot leadership has intercepted this order and is waging this revolutionary war for independence in order to keep them from becoming free. And this then can be inspirational to African Americans in the South to try to run away and get to the British troops 
in order to help them win the Revolutionary War. But I would also say that in the northern colonies, where slavery is less present, the numbers of slaves are fewer, that there the tendency is to try to assist the Continental Army of the Patriots in the hope that by doing so they will win their freedom. So you have African Americans who are serving on both sides, in larger numbers on the British side, but in significant numbers on the Patriot side as well, with a skew of service for the Patriots in the North and a skew towards service with the British in the South. Okay, it's time for a short break. When we return, I'll continue my conversation with historian Alan Taylor about his new book on the American Revolution. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. One of the things that seems to be a crucial moment in the war just in terms of the dynamics of the war as it plays out, is Lord Dunmore's proclamation granting emancipation to any African-American that did fight for the British. This, from his perspective, seemed like a good idea at the time. He's a loyalist governor and wants to boost the, the cause of the, you know, essentially suppressing the revolution. But in many ways, it's, it's seen as a move that backfires because of its impact on white Southerners. Yeah. When he issues this order, he is doing it primarily thinking that he's going to intimidate the white patriots into backing down and submitting again to crown authority in order to maintain their control over their enslaved people. Instead, what it does is it rallies these wavering people, many of the wavering people in Virginia who owned slaves or who aspired someday to own slaves, into rallying to the patriot cause. And so... On balance, while he does get a substantial number of African Americans to run away and join his forces, it rallies more patriots against Dunmore's efforts to restore royal control in Virginia. And news of what Dunmore has done also will then rally planters deeper in the South, particularly in South Carolina, to become patriots. And it creates one of those great American dilemmas that, you know, for many of those Southerners, they're fighting a war of liberty. And the way they define that is principally the liberty to continue to own other people as slaves. So it's one of those many ironies and contradictions that we find in the founding period, and that, of course, persist way beyond. Well, we tend to see it more clearly as a contradiction than many people at the time did. For the Southern planters, what they are fighting for is their liberty to protect their private property. And their private property includes enslaved people. Now, we have come to see that as a contradiction, and a very good thing that we have come to see it as a contradiction. And some people at the time were beginning to see it as a contradiction. But not all Americans did see it as a contradiction. They could see a compatibility between their freedom and their ability to own other human beings. And that's a hard thing for us to grasp, and it's something that I'm trying to explain in the book, how people could consider themselves perfectly good patriots and own slaves. Yeah, and we, of course, see that in the Jefferson and the, the lofty language of the Declaration of Independence. It's, it's evident everywhere, and it is a hard thing for modern people to understand how that could make sense and could not be seen as a contradiction. Right. And in noting this, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to excuse anybody for anything they've done in the past, but I just think that we can't understand the past unless we understand how the people in the past justified themselves. Right, and some of the models that they, they saw themselves modeling themselves on. So when founders began to think about republics, they looked to ancient Greece and Rome, where, of course, they noted that both those societies had huge populations that were enslaved. So they didn't see it necessarily as a historical or an ideological contradiction at all. Well, some did, but many did not. So 
There's a lot of wrestling with consciences that goes on in the revolutionary era over this very issue of what exactly can they do to try to restrict the growth of slavery or perhaps to, in fact, roll back slavery. And there are some successes in the northern states. They do adopt gradual emancipation laws, but they are usually very gradual. So there will still be plenty of enslaved people remaining in New Jersey or New York or even Pennsylvania on after the year 1800. So that actually leads to my next question, which is, again, moving the clock forward because your book does cover so much territory, is about the Constitution. This is the new form of government that replaces the original one that was established under the Articles of Confederation. How is the Constitution in many ways a product of the same divisive forces of race and class and same product of the disputed definitions of liberty, equality, and democracy that we were just talking about that raged during the revolution? How is the Constitution also a product of these similar issues and unresolved issues? Well, the revolution, because it's expensive, it's expensive in lives, it's expensive in money, generates enormous debts for the Continental Congress and for the states. And they struggle to come up with equitable mechanisms for funding these debts. And in most states, they will actually settle on some pretty inequitable mechanisms, very regressive taxation. And at a time when people are struggling to pay their private debts, and there is initially an inflationary surge of paper money from these states and from the Continental Congress. But by the early 1780s, these states have gone in reverse, and they are insisting upon hard money policies, which then hurt a great number of particularly consumers and, and common people. So the, the shift of policies toward more aggressive taxation and toward a smaller money supply and toward a fairly strict collection of private debts is hurtful, particularly for the vast majority of Americans who owe money as taxpayers and as debtors. And these policies are more in the interest of people who are creditors and who tend to be better educated, wealthier people with political connections, and they're using those connections to try to protect themselves after having suffered from the inflationary policies initially adopted by the states. So there's a lot of political tension within the United States and at each state level. And it looks like the Articles of Confederation is faltering. So for dual reasons, the top leadership of the patriots and the nation wants to reform the Articles of Confederation to create a stronger national government. And it wants that stronger national government to be able to control the states in important ways, particularly to prevent them from reverting back to soft money policies that had been inflationary and had hurt the interests of creditors. And so the Constitution on that level is aiming to address a, a serious economic problem, and it has important class implications. What else is at work in the Constitutional Convention and in the final outcome of the product that, that harkens back to some of the issues that were raised and not resolved during the revolution? Well, the United States is a big country, even then. It didn't extend to the Pacific Ocean, but in theory, it extends to the Mississippi River. And there's a considerable variety as you go from New England on south. And the leaders of these different states are coming to focus on the difference that slavery makes in their societies. It means that New Englanders who are quite hoping that there will be a federal government that will be able to regulate commerce and regulate it in ways that would favor their ships at the expense of foreign ships. Their interests are a bit at odds with Southerners who are not so big on shipping, but are big on exporting their crops and want to be able to have virtually any nation come in with its ships and pick up their crops. And then there's also concerns over fugitive slaves who are leaving Southern states and going to Northern states in hope of attaining freedom. And there's a general concern about whether the slave trade bringing in Africans in slavery ought to persist. And so on these issues, and then there's also the issue of representation, should the slaves of the South be counted in allocating members of the House of Representatives and therefore the Electoral College for the presidency? It's not that the Southern slaves would get to vote by any means, but if these slaves are counted, then it means that a southern state like Virginia will have many more representatives 
than if they are not counted because they are not citizens. And so this becomes a battle line. And so what's at stake is what will be the regional balance of power. And this will require very difficult compromises in order for this constitution to move forward out of the convention. The compromises around slavery are certainly the most notable ones. Well, your book continues on up all the way up to, to 1804. And I guess I had one question about how you ultimately chose where to end the book. There were a couple of familiar stopping points in, in books about the revolution, and then yours goes even further. But how did you choose to round things off in 1804? Well, I wanted readers to get more for their money. But the serious reason was that in 1804, a couple of things that happened just the year before, Louisiana Purchase, and in many ways, the Louisiana Purchase, by nearly doubling the size of the United States and extending its claims as far as the Rocky Mountains and potentially all the way to the Pacific and the Pacific Northwest, that addition is resolving many of the Western issues that had been at the heart of the revolutionary crisis, first of the crisis of the empire and trying to control the West, and then the crisis of the United States and trying to ensure that as its people expanded westward, that they would be incorporated peacefully into the United States, rather than, for example, become some sort of set of independent states or spinning off and favoring the Spanish and the British in the North and the South. So that's one reason why in there. And the other is that Haiti becomes an independent nation in 1804. And this is the second independent nation in the Americas to achieve that independence through a colonial war of liberation. And the fact that the Haitians are almost all the descendants of enslaved Africans is something that renders the Haitian Revolution a controversial one in the eyes of white Americans who are quite troubled at seeing former slaves rising up and achieving their freedom by killing white people. And there is a fear that the Haitian example will be exported to the southern states of the United States. So most Americans, rather than identifying the Haitians as fellow revolutionaries, see them as, in effect, terrorists. And they want to delegitimize the Haitian Revolution as not the same thing as the American Revolution. So I see the response to the Haitian Revolution as helping to define the memory of the American Revolution in more conservative terms than it had previously been defined. And that begins way back in the early 19th century. Well, that sort of sets up my final question, which is, in some ways, I look at your book as a I don't know if this is an explicit motivation, but as an anti-triumphalist account of the revolution, you know, that tries to cut through some of those conservative and more traditional, happy, simplistic versions of the revolution and the whole revolutionary period, and the mythological images of the key figures and founders. And I'm wondering if it's true, and if that's how you see one of the important goals of the book. Why do you think that's important? Why is it important in 2016 to present Americans with a different take on the revolution that in some ways is attempting to kind of shatter some of these older illusions about what the war was really about, what the Constitution was really about? Well, I think it's our job as historians to tell the truth as best we understand it. And I do think that the mythic version of the American Revolution of a united American people achieving their independence against the British Empire is a distortion of the historical record that I have seen. And so I'm just trying to convey what I see as a more authentic view of that generation in American history and to expand the geographic scale of the story so that it also involves Native peoples and also involves Canada and the Caribbean and Spanish colonies of the Southwest. And I think that if you do that, it provides a more authentic version of the revolution, one that rings truer is people read it. And I do think that the revolution achieves some very important things, foundational institutions and foundational values for Americans that we should cherish. So the point of telling what I see as the authentic story with, with its fair share of disturbing elements is not to erase the positives and say there was nothing except for these 
disturbing elements, but to see this as a very hard-fought revolution, one in which there were plenty of internal divisions and plenty of moments where the revolutionary movement might have collapsed. But if we see it in its full range of difficulties, that we have an even greater appreciation of the positive dimensions that came out of that struggle. And I do think that as citizens of this country, that the values, that the positive values that we associate with the revolution of equality, of opportunity, and of equal rights, they are things that we have to maintain. They weren't achieved by autopilot. They weren't achieved easily by the generation of the revolutionaries. And we won't keep them easily, but they have to be fought for. They have to be defended. And not all Americans will agree about the right ways to bolster those values. We will continue to debate those right ways. And it is that very debate that is at the essence of our politics. And I hope it will always be at the heart of our politics. Because if not, then I think we truly will have lost what is of the greatest benefit that has come out of that revolutionary generation. I can't, can't imagine putting it any better. That's excellent. And your book is, is a terrific read and really well-timed for that, for that purpose that you just stated. Well, Alan, thank you so much for talking to us at In the Past Line. I really appreciate you taking the time, and best of luck with the book. Well, thank you very much. Alan Taylor is professor of history at the University of Virginia. He spoke to us today at In the Past Lane about his latest book, American Revolutions, A Continental History, 1750 to 1804, just published by W.W. Norton. Wow. Like I said, Alan Taylor's new book really shakes up the way we think about the American Revolution. It's a terrific example of how historians always revisit, re-examine, and reinterpret historical events and people. We often hear people these days speak disparagingly about revisionist history, as though it's some sort of a bad thing. But the truth is, all good historians are revisionists. That's what we do. We bring new questions, new evidence, new theories, and new perspectives to our studies so that we can deepen the understanding of particular historical events, people, institutions, practices, and ideas. And, as Alan Taylor just said, while this often sheds light on unsavory facts and difficult truths from the past, we shouldn't shy away from these things. They help deepen our understanding of the past, and they can deepen our appreciation for the many remarkable achievements of the people involved. Once you get past the idea that history should be neat and tidy, and that it should only affirm our beliefs rather than challenge them, history becomes a whole lot more interesting and more relevant to our lives here and now. Coming up, we explore another hidden story from the American Revolution. Don't go anywhere, people. All right, we are back here at In the Past Lane, and with me now is Jim Moran, Director of Outreach at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts, one of the great historical archives in the United States. Thanks for joining us here at In the Past Lane, Jim. My pleasure to be here. Well, we're talking to you today because we're talking about the American Revolution, and we'd like to learn about a story that's long been overlooked in the histories of the American Revolution, and that is the Revolution of 1774 that took place right here in Worcester, Massachusetts, where you and I both work. So tell us about it. Well, you know, a lot of people kind of assume the revolution starts with the battles of Lexington and Concord in 1775, in April of 1775. And sometimes people think about it going back to the Boston Tea Party in December of 1773. But somehow we kind of jump from the Boston Tea Party to the outbreak of war. Well, there's a year there in between what's going on. And what's going on is that population in the rural part, particularly of Massachusetts, really turns against the crown and in many ways rises up against the crown and overtakes the crown government and establishes in really in many ways their own inherent government. 
It's a government that existed and has existed for a century or more through the Charter and through our own self-governance. But it is really taken away by the Crown, and it's taken away by one of the coercive acts that we don't pay much attention to, which is the Massachusetts Government Act. The coercive acts that we pay most attention to, I think, are the closing of the Boston port. That's the thing that gets all the, the play. And just to clarify, the coercive acts are a series of laws passed by Parliament in response to the outrage of the Boston Tea Party in late 1773. Exactly. And there are four of them. One closes the Boston port uh, to commercial activity. One really essentially allows for the Crown to take people away and be tried in England rather than tried locally by a, a jury of their peers. One is the Quartering Act, which everybody knows really allows the Crown to quarter people in people's homes if there isn't other housing available. But the Massachusetts Government Act is the most severe, and it impacts the most people in the colony. It revokes the 1691 charter granted to the colony and restructures colonial government and basically puts most of that government in the hands of the royal governor, who at this time is Thomas Gage, who is a a general and is a military man. And it also takes away a lot of the local empowerment. It does things like allows sheriffs to appoint jurors rather than being elected by the people. It goes so far as to even eliminate town meetings, restricting them to one time a year, and that their agendas need to be approved by the royal governor before they can enact. And this, you know, flies in the face of what we've been doing since 1691, actually since really 1620 when the pilgrims land, where we are a people used to governing ourselves, used to making decisions on a local basis, and really every single community is outraged by this. The closing of the Boston port really impacts the people of Boston the most. It doesn't cripple the colonial economy as much as people think because there's another port in Salem that's open. There's another port in Newport. I mean, there are ways to get around it. But canceling a town meeting, there's no way to get around that. And it really enrages people. And they respond to this in a number of ways. One, they they see themselves as part of the British Empire and part of the consumer power of the British Empire. We are buying British goods in exchange for raw materials. So they start developing covenants, non-importation covenants, that basically say, let's not buy any British goods. The The boycotts. boycotts. The famous boycotts. And they also will establish committees of correspondence so they can talk to one another about what they're doing. And in the late summer of 1774, they start closing the royal courts. They start in the county of Hampshire, and specifically on September 6th, 1774, 4,622 militiamen from 37 different communities in Worcester County come to the Shire town of Worcester, close the courthouse. They literally bar the door. They form two lines of militiamen. They take all of the court-appointed officials, round them up, force them to recant their position under the Massachusetts Government Act. They craft language to that effect, force them to literally take their hats off and recite this recantation enough times that every single militiaman can hear it. So it's a huge street political theater event. It's also a very peaceful event. The militia come prepared to do battle because they assume Gage will send troops to protect the courts. But Gage has been told by various loyalists, people that are in his inner circle, that to do that would really indeed start bloodshed, start the revolution. So he says, okay, I won't do that. I won't send the troops. When the militia understand that there will be no troops there. They lay down their arms. They don't bring them into the town. It is a very peaceful operation in that sense. And it's a very, in one sense, a very democratic one, because there are thousands of people involved, and even how they structure this street theater is improvised on the spot. It's a long period of time while people gather, try to decide, okay, how are we going to do this? What are we going to ask them to recant? What's the language of that recantation? How are we going to do this so everybody can participate? They meet, they discuss, they vote on it. So it's a very populist kind of ideal and a very communal one. 
And it's the largest single one. It's not the first court closing, but it's the largest and the most dramatic in terms of the numbers. And from that moment on, there is no royal government outside of Boston. Essentially, all of the royal authority shifts, really shifts to the committees of correspondence who really kind of take over a lot of the legal and political activity that was happening in the towns. And they are communicating with one another. They're holding a series of conventions, county-wide conventions, and then provincial-wide conventions that, again, are knitting the colony together and kind of creating the beginning of what will eventually become the Massachusetts state government. An alternative government that that, that becomes the eventual government. Yeah. And from September into October and November, the other thing they do is they reorganize the militias and they basically get rid of any loyalists in the militias. They solidify the Whig or what we call the patriots, the people who are thinking about rebelling to make sure that they're in charge of those militias. They also form what they call the Minutemen, which were really the shock troops of the day. They were the, the most elite, the best fit people who would respond the quickest and would be the most effective fighters. And they also, interestingly enough, vote to take their tax money and essentially put it in another account. Don't give it to the crown. So escrow it, yeah. But escrow it and use it for this kind of nascent rebellion and this this shadow government that will really stay in place until we declare independence and until we we form our state government. So in, in some ways, you could kind of say that the revolution begins in 1774. I think more realistically, it's an important chapter in the way we rebel. The rebellion is a a long process. And as Alan Taylor has pointed out in his book, it's even longer than we think. It's a long process that has fits and starts and goes in many different directions as we develop into an independent country. And it seems to naturally, as one would expect, involve a fair amount of improvisation. And, and all, which, there's yeah. no playbook for a democratic revolution. You're so right, exactly. Let's, let's These write, people are making it up as they go. As, as they go along. So that's great. And it's a really fascinating thing. Fully seven months before Lexington and Concord, there's this crowd action that's very purposeful and, and carries out this act that clearly fits into the narrative, the long narrative of the American Revolution. So what have you and what role has the American Antiquarian Society played in kind of bringing this back to the public consciousness? Most of the credit needs to go to a man named Ray Raphael, who came to the society and uncovered this event in a journal of Ebenezer Parkman. He kept a diary for about 40 years. He was the minister of a church in Westboro, Massachusetts. And his diary account for September 6th details the list of militia, the number of men who came from each community, and where they lined up on Main Street in Worcester. And Ray looked at this and said, "What you know? What's this all about? Why have I not heard about this?" And he wrote a book called "The First American Revolution," based upon that. And we also have the records of an organization called the American Political Society, which was a secret organization in Worcester that was overthrowing the Tory landholding genteel people at this time, as well as fermenting this larger revolution. So he used those documents to kind of tell this story and to publish those books. And in 2014, we joined with other local organizations and individuals, including the Worcester Historical Museum and the Daughter and Sons of the American Revolution, to create a county-wide celebration and commemoration of this event. We did a wide variety of things as part of that, including engaging the 37 communities that sent militia to Worcester. We did lectures and programs in each of the 37 communities. Uh, One of the communities even marched into Worcester uh, on a day-long hike. And it all culminated in a one-day festival uh, that occurred on September 7th of 2014. And that had all kinds of activities from exhibits to lectures to musical performances. And I was commissioned to write a play about this whole event entitled The Chains of Liberty, and that was performed twice on that day. I'm very pleased to tell you that that whole project was awarded an award of merit by the American Association of State and Local History. It was just a a wonderful way for us to engage the public 
in a little known event and for all of these communities to kind of take some pride in what happened 200 years ago, but also to engage in a journey of discovery to uncover a lot of this hidden history. Right. I mean, it's a great example of the Antiquarian Society is over 200 years old and has always, for most of its history, just been a fantastic archive of history. And this is certainly something that wouldn't have been imaginable 30, 40 years ago. But now the society has really made a terrific effort in the last decades to really reach out to the public. You are the director of outreach. So it seems like an excellent event for that sort of thing. Absolutely. We've engaged with different audiences than we ever did in the past. We now really offer all programs for all kinds of people, from students in K-12 to teachers teaching K-12 to our traditional scholars and undergraduate students and the general public. And this is one way we can engage with the community. And again, it's connected directly to the material in our library. It all starts with documents. It does. It's, it's also a curious story about this story. You know, I think we our understanding of the revolution's beginnings really comes from Longfellow's great poem, Paul Revere's Ride. In reading that poem, you get the sense that Paul Revere is truly waking up a sleeping countryside, when it, in fact, in 1775, just the opposite is true. The countryside is wide awake. On edge. On edge. They're just waiting to, to pull the trigger. And what we don't realize is that poem was written in 1861, and it's really a poem about the American Civil War and the countryside that Revere is, and Longfellow is hoping to wake up is the North against the South. Yeah, it's an act of imagination and political imagination in his own time. Right. As often historical works of fiction are, they're about another war. I mean, Johnny Tremaine, that great young adult novel about the American Revolution, is really about World War II when it was written. And so it's kind of interesting how we kind of see and create and understand history through the lens of the present. Indeed. Well, that's a great place to leave it. Well, Jim, thank you so much for talking to us at In the Past Lane. Jim Moran is Director of Outreach at the American Antiquarian Society, a National Research Archive and Library of American History in Worcester, Massachusetts. Well, people, as always, this has been a lot of fun, but I'm afraid we are out of time. I want to thank you for listening. And I want to hear from you. So send along your comments, questions, and suggestions via Facebook and Twitter. I also encourage you to visit our website, inthepastlane.com. At this site, you'll find a show page for this episode that includes show notes, links, essays, images, and further reading suggestions related to all the stuff we've talked about in this episode. It also includes more information about our guests, correspondents, and other contributors. It's all there at inthepastlane.com. And please, subscribe to the In the Past Lane podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. And when you do, please leave a starred review and a comment. It really helps. Thanks. In the Past Lane has been made possible by the hard work and dedication of many people. They include technical advisors Holly Hunt and Jesse Anderson, podcasting consultant Daryl Darnell of Pro Podcast Solutions, photographer John Buckingham, graphic designer Maggie Salucci, Website by ERI Design. Legal Services, Tippa Canoe and Tyler 2. Social Media Management, The Pony Express. Risk Assessment, Little Bighorn Associates. Growth Strategies, 54, 40 or Fight. And of course, there'd be no In the Past Lane podcast without our executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Special thanks also to Jay Graham for creating the intro music for this podcast and to the Free Music Archive for providing the rest of the music for this episode. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Lulu, you get the last word. Go. Your crappy Wi-Fi is down again. SBI. Snoring Beagle International.